This evening, if you'd like to follow along in the reading of God's Word, I'd like uh, to have you turn to Exodus 34. I'm going to read verses 1 through 8. We're going to look at, though more particularly, verses 6 and 7, where the Lord tells Moses precisely what he is like, as it were, he expounds his name, what it means that he is the Lord. And we've already looked at a couple of these attributes, particularly the fact that God is compassionate, uh, that is, he is merciful, and also that he is gracious. But this evening we want to look at specifically his patience. Exodus 34, let me read for you verses 1 through 8. Now the Lord said to Moses, Cut out for yourself two stone tablets like the former ones, and I will write on the tablets the words that were on the former tablets which you shattered. So be ready by morning and come up in the morning to Mount Sinai and present yourself there to me on the top of the mountain. And no man is to come up with you, nor let any man be seen anywhere on the mountain. Even the flocks and the herds may not graze in front of that mountain. So he cut out two stone tablets like the former ones, and Moses rose up early in the morning and went up to Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him, and he took two stone tablets in his hand. And the Lord ascended in the cloud and stood there with him as he called upon the name of the Lord. Then the Lord passed by in front of him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin. Yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and on the grandchildren to the third and fourth generations. And Moses made haste to bow low toward the earth and worship. May the Lord bless his word to our hearing this evening. By the way, we often think about uh, God in terms of that last part. He visits the iniquity of the fathers on the children. Maybe we don't think so much about the generations down the line, but we certainly think about the fact that God is a just God. And we're going to get to that eventually in our study to find out that that is also another reason why we should love him. But what we're focusing on particularly now is that love that God has for his people that makes him compassionate, that makes him gracious, that makes him slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and forgiving toward those who love him. By the way, the Lord says here as well that he keeps his loving kindness for thousands and I just want to remind you that means thousands of generations. Uh, what we do will influence the generations that come from our loins. But now we're looking at why it is you should love God, and certainly you know there's many reasons why you should love Him. You should love Him because, first of all, He is the one who gave you life, the one who gave you existence. He's the one who created you, who spoke you into existence. I know when you think about your beginnings, you probably look your parents and realize that, okay, this is how the Lord made me, or maybe you don't even think about that. I was born of two parents. But you realize that they only exist because God made man, and because God gave man the power to procreate, and that God sustained the world and allowed this to go on until you finally came into being. You owe the existence of your, your body to the Lord. He's the one who ultimately made you. But it's also true that when you were conceived, at that very moment that the Lord created your soul, that part of you which is really you, He gave you your existence. And of course, for these things, you should be deeply thankful uh, to Him. And you realize, of course, that God is also the one who has taken care of you every moment of your life from the time that you were conceived to the present. Every bite of food, every stitch of clothing, every breath that you breathe, every good thing that you've ever had, even the, the walls and the roofs that have sheltered you all your life, all of these things have come from God's hand. So you should love him because he's been so gracious to you, because you don't deserve these things, I don't deserve these things. 
and because he has been so generous. Certainly in this Western world, the Lord has been very generous. I think it's because of the Lord's mercies earlier on, and giving to us, again, Christian forefathers in many different ways. I mean, we, had, we, we did have at one time a, very, a, a society very strongly influenced by the gospel and many people who were serving and walking with him. And again, when the Lord says that he uh, bounds in loving kindness, keeps loving kindness for thousands of generations, I think we are experiencing blessings from what has gone on before us. But God has been very generous. And certainly the Lord has provided something far more valuable than any physical provision, although those things are important. He has also provided salvation. Because remember, even though you weren't in the garden uh, with Adam, at least personally, you were with him at least in the sense of representation. And God looks at you as he looks at Adam. You were born with Adam's sin. You rebelled in Adam. You actually rebelled against God. But the Lord did not leave you to die in your sins. He did not leave you to suffer the agonies in hell that you deserve. But rather, he sent the one that he loves the most to live for you and to die for you to suffer hell on the cross for you so that you might live. So we ask the question, why should you love God? Well, just from the things that we've seen just tonight, you'd be insane not to love God. But again, this only half answers the question. What God has done for you is only part of the reason why you should love him. We've been focusing on the fact that you should love God because of who he is and not just because of what he has done for you. What kind of a being is this that we are to love and worship that would make you, would create you knowing that you would fall away from him, knowing that you would rebel, knowing that you would hate, and yet he would choose to provide for you every single day that you hated him, talking, of course, about the time before you came to know him, that he would even send his son to die for you while you were still his mortal enemy. What kind of a God is this? Well, as Moses tells us this evening, he is compassionate. His mercies are over all his works. He is gracious. He gives eternal life to those who deserve eternal damnation. He is abounding in loving kindness, this, this love that he purposed to give you in eternity through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. He is abounding in loving kindness. And that's because he is, as the Bible says, love. He has an, an absolute and infinite love for what is good and for what is right. He is holy. And that holiness, though that is the thing that makes the unbeliever afraid of God, it's the very thing that should make you Love him because it is what makes him do what he does and what he has done for you. Now, again, the question we're asking this evening is, can you love a God like this? Shouldn't you love a God like this? Do you love this God? Now, this evening, we're going to want to consider another attribute that flows from his love toward you that should make you love him even more. And that, of course, you know, is his patience. His patience, as you've already heard, is why he did not destroy you when you first came into the world, because at that point of conception, you were guilty. Guilty enough to enter into hell. That patience of his is why he continued to provide for you throughout your life, even while you were in rebellion against him. And it's why he continues to work with you to grant you his grace and his mercies. Why it is that God continues to forgive you even though, as a believer, you sin against him not just once a day, but many times every single day and every single one of those sins deserves damnation. You should love him because he is patient. Now let's look at three things this evening from just this one point in the text that God is slow to anger. Let's look, first of all, at what it means that God is patient. Secondly, how he is patient toward you, not only in the past, but also in the present. 
and why it is that God can be patient. First of all, what does it mean that God is patient? And I hope you understand what patience is because it's very important. It literally means, for God at least, and, and for us as well, whoever it's applied to, that it takes a long time for God to get angry. I don't know if, if Josh ran across this in seminary, if somebody pointed it out, but in Hebrew it's expressed in a rather humorous way. God has length of nose. In other words, God has a long nose. Now this is a Hebrew idiom that refers to patience. It doesn't mean that God has a face that looks like Jimmy Durante. I don't know if any of you remember what Jimmy Durante looks like. Somebody who has a very outstanding nose, very large nose. Because we know that God doesn't have a nose. God is an infinite spirit. God doesn't have flesh and bones as we have, as our Lord Jesus Christ reminded his disciples. What it means is that if he had a nose, that his nose would take a long time to turn red. Not that it would be long this way, but it takes long, a long time to change color. Because to the Jewish mind, your nose turns red when you get angry. And if your nose takes a long time to turn red, it means that you are patient. It means that you can put up with a lot before your nose changes color. Now what this means is that God will endure a lot. He will put up with a great deal before he will allow himself to express his righteous anger. Another word that is used for this is long suffering. Uh, that's what patience is. Things are, are happening or being done to you personally that are offensive and yet you suffer as it were. You put up with it patiently and you do not get angry. Well, that is what God is like. He is offended every single day. He's offended by every single person in this world. We are offensive to him in certain ways and yet God puts up with us. Just consider the history of Israel and how the Lord was patient with them, even though the majority of them were unconverted people. How many times did the Lord come to them to explain to them what the right thing to do was, what it was that was pleasing to him? And yet how many times did they break his commandments and do exactly what he told them not to do and provoked him to his face? How many times did God send his prophets to warn them to get them to turn away from their sins, to get back into the path of blessing before he would send his judgment. And how many times did the Lord actually reverse that judgment and turn it back into blessing when his people repented and sought after him? Well, this is what love does. Love is patient. Uh, God is love, and so he is patient. So that's what it means that God is patient, but let's consider this more personally now. Let's consider how patient God has been toward you. Now we often read the history of Israel, and perhaps you've read the history of Israel and you think, you know what, God did so much for those people. He was so gracious to them in so many ways, and yet they turned out to be such a bunch of ungrateful and sinful folks. Well, they were. We know that that's true but you need to realize that we are just like them. And let me ask you for a few moments just to consider your own life to see how patient the Lord has been with you. Now think about that time when you didn't know the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, think about the time also about what your life was like prior to even remembering what your life was like. And I, what I mean here is let's push it back to the infant stage and consider what we were like as children. Now you may have thought that your parents had a very virtuous child, but you need to realize that you were sinful and you were rebellious. That's true of every single person. When Solomon prayed at the dedication of the temple, there is no one living who does not sin. There is no one who does right all the time. That is just as true today as it was then. There's that whole time in your life, that part that you can't even remember the, when you were very, very young. Just think about the infants that you know. You know, you really don't know what you're like until you grow up and have your own children 
and then you get to see what you were like, and then you really begin to appreciate your parents, something your parents wish that you had done many, many years earlier. But it's because of what children are like. When you were a child, you constantly cried and complained because things were not exactly the way you wanted them to be. You cried every time that your diaper got dirty, and of course you were the one who dirtied it. You cried every time you got hungry, every time you got bored when your swing stopped swinging or when the toys got, got you got tired of playing with those particular toys or you wanted to look at something different. You got tired of what you were doing. Or when you just simply got sleepy. Now we look back at those times and we think, well, that's kind of cute. Especially cute when, when you're past that stage and you think back, you know, when it actually took place and you're not still in it because when you're in it, it really is not that cute. But you look back on it with these fond memories, but you've got to realize that your children, what they were expressing at that time was very selfish, was very sinful. Now, we would agree that their needs are legitimate. You know, I mean, they were hungry, they were dirty, they were uncomfortable, they were bored, okay? They have legitimate needs that need to be met. But the way that you as a child expressed you know, how and when those needs would be met were very sinful because you wanted it now. You were very impatient. You wanted what you wanted when you wanted it. John MacArthur once had, um, I can't remember the gentleman's name, but he was the former chief of police of Los Angeles, come and give a, 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 a I don't know if it was a sermon or if it was a, some kind of a talk at his church, and he pointed out, again, the sinfulness of human beings, and he gave this example. He said, if a baby had a gun and knew how to use it, it would kill for its food when it's hungry. Now, I don't know if that's the way you think about children, but I think there is some truth to that because they want it now, they scream, they cry, and so forth. Well, that is what you were like. That is what I was like, and yet God put up with us during that time frame. Now, what about the part of your life that you can remember as you continue to grow? What about your relationship with your brothers and sisters or your friends? Was there any selfishness there? Did you ever have difficulty sharing what you had with others, sharing your food, sharing your, your uh, dessert or whatever it may be, your toys? Did you ever lie when you were growing up? Did you ever lie about somebody else to get them into trouble and to get you out of trouble? Or did you lie about somebody just so other people wouldn't like them and they would like you more? Uh, what about the times that you made life difficult for your parents by not obeying your parents, by not respecting your parents, by speaking harshly to your parents or speaking about them in a way that was dishonoring to them or not loving them? Now think about the things you did to provoke God when you were a, a young adult, the relationships that you had with other people that you knew were a bad influence and yet you still pursued those things. The commandments of the Lord that you broke, and again, the thing that plagues most young people are those that have to do with sexual purity. Consider the things you've done even since you've been a Christian. The times that you should have spoken up for the Lord, for His honor, and yet you didn't do that. The opportunities that you let slip through your fingers to witness for Him. Uh, those besetting sins that you have to fight with but yet so often fail to resist in the way that you should. The times that you should have reached out to a neighbor or a, a brother or sister in Christ to help them and yet you didn't do that. Have you ever taken a good look at your life before the Lord? Not the one that you show to everybody outwardly but the one that really exists within your own heart, the real you. Have you ever looked at yourself and just wondered how could God ever love you? How could he ever put up with you for so long and still give you good things? I mean, how can he continue to see all these sins that you commit in your heart, in your mind, even as a Christian, even with all these benefits, and still love you? I mean, I've wondered that about myself numerous times. How can God love me? Why would he ever choose me? Why would he ever save me? I'm just, you know, dishonoring to him. Well, the reason why he can do that for you and for me is because he has length of nose, because he is patient, because it takes him a long time to get angry, because God is long-suffering. If he wasn't, none of us would be here this evening. 
John Newton tells us that he experienced this patience of God in his own life, which is what moved him to pen these familiar words. Could we bear from one another what he daily bears from us daily? He bears from us daily. Yet this glorious friend and brother loves us, though we treat him thus. Though for good we render ill, he accounts us brethren still. Now think about the number of people that have offended you and that you don't particularly like because of that. And yet how many times have you treated the Lord in exactly the same way? You've offended him, and yet he still loves you. And even during those times when he appears to be angry and he disciplines you, he still does that because he loves you and because he wants to work some good in your life. God is patient. God has been, and he continues to be patient with you and with me. The question is, can you love a God like this? The question I keep asking myself is, why wouldn't somebody love him? Why, how could they not love him? He, he is absolutely perfect. His, his uh, love is infinite in all of its expressions. And everyone has tasted of the kindness of the Lord. So God is patient, and God has certainly been patient toward each one of us here this evening. But the last point is, is this question, how or, or why can God be patient? I think you know the answer to that. He can only be patient because of his son. Remember that any single one of the sins that you committed while you were an unbeliever, as well as the sins you commit as a believer, any single one of those would be enough to damn you forever. Every single one of those deserves damnation. I like the way the Puritans put it in our confession. They remind us of that very fact, that the slightest, even the slightest sin is enough to condemn us, but even the greatest sin will never condemn us because of what Jesus Christ has done. But you must never forget that that is the reason why you should hate sin, is because it's an offense to God and it deserves damnation, even the smallest sin. Now, the only reason why God doesn't give you what you deserve for those sins is because he has already given it to Jesus Christ when he poured his wrath out against him on the cross. If you're a believer here this evening, that is why God is patient with you. And that is why your sins do not condemn you because of what Jesus Christ has done. God could not be patient with anyone. He could only deal out justice if it wasn't for Jesus Christ. When Jesus paid it all, he suffered to the full extent of God's justice for your sins. He laid the groundwork for his Father's patience. And so you must not forget that that is the reason for it. And remember that Jesus is not to be conceived of as somebody standing be between you and God who's trying to, you know, hold back his Father's wrath. But the Father is the one who, out of his love, provided the Savior so that he could be patient with you. As we saw last week in the book of Lamentations, the Lord's loving kindnesses indeed never cease, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Now again, how can you not love someone like this who is willing to take what you deserve and to lay it upon his only begotten son, the one whom he loves more than anyone else? He is far more than worthy that you should love him. And you need to realize that no one that you will ever love in this life, and there are people that we all love, but no one you will ever love will ever be as patient and as loving as God is because his patience is as limitless as his love. Now let me close by simply speaking to those of you who haven't received Jesus Christ as your Savior. You need to realize that God is patient toward the impenitent as well as he is toward those who are repentant. He waits to be gracious to you. And you know that he has because he has preserved your life to this point. He hasn't snuffed it out. And he continually is offering his son to you. 
week after week. God is patient. But you know as well as I that the patience of God towards unbelievers does have an end. It doesn't go on forever. Now, we saw this, I believe it was last Sunday morning when we were consider considering the unpardonable sin. I mean, there is a limit to which a person can go and provoke God. They can provoke God to the point where he will no longer have anything to do with them, and there is no hope from that point on. Well, the Lord has blessed you with his truth. Not everyone in the world knows the gospel that can save them. The Lord has made continual overtures of love toward you, offers of his grace, offers of his mercy. The Lord promises full forgiveness and reconciliation if you will only receive his son. Now, if you continue to refuse and turn away from the Lord, you could pass the point of no return. Remember those people we were looking at in the book of Hebrews who had, uh, well, had basically tasted of the powers of the age to come, had been made partakers, at least at some level, of the Holy Spirit, and who knew the gospel, and yet they were being tempted to go back to Judaism only to save their skins from Roman persecution. The author to the Hebrews said, for them, there was no repentance. It was impossible to renew them again to repentance because they had so much light, so much privilege. They had everything that was necessary to bring a person to Christ, and yet they still turned against him, still put him to open shame. They crucified to themselves again the Son of God by basically saying he deserved to be crucified because they turned away from him. There's a point at which God will remove his overtures of grace and mercy. If you continue to rebel, if you continue to resist, if you continue to refuse. And of course, we all know that death, which is a very real certainty, will bring a close to the day of his grace once and for all. And so let me encourage you this evening not to trade upon the patience of God. God will not keep his anger forever, the scripture says. And why would you want to run the risk of facing his wrath when the son has already done that so that you might escape if you will only turn to him? Trust in the Lord Jesus while it is the day of his mercy and grace and receive his love and his forgiveness instead of his wrath. The Lord is patient. And he desires that you turn to him and be saved. God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked, the Bible says. And I believe that that's true at every level. God does not, is not pleased when that takes place because he doesn't desire that people suffer. He doesn't enjoy, as it were, that suffering, but rather that the wicked man turn from his sins and be saved. And we do know that in God's plan, people do die. And we do know that God is glorified in in the, well, as it were, the, the uh, exhibition of his justice. But God doesn't delight in that suffering of that individual as it takes place in and of itself. God desires, rather, that the wicked turn from their sins and that they be forgiven, that they be reconciled. And we need to be thankful that he does. But again, remember, the patience of God has an end. So don't provoke him any further, but trust in him. Receive his grace, receive his son, and receive forgiveness and reconciliation. Well, let's bow in a moment of prayer, and let's meditate on the fact that God is, in fact, patient. And let's remember to thank him for it. Let it also be a means to provoke you, as it were, in a good sense, to give yourself even more fully to him, thinking about all that God has done, as well as everything that he is should increase your love for him. And as it does, it should increase uh, really the degree to which you should offer yourself to him and serve him. So let's dedicate ourselves again to the Lord in light of this infinite love.